Hello and welcome to this last session of this online course on introduction to embedded system design. I am your instructor Dhananjay Gadre. In this session, we are going to go through all the topics that we covered and then terminate this session with a project description which will help you to uh, visualize, to plan and to implement a MSP 430 and for that matter any microcontroller based project. We have already seen some implementation issues uh, which we will discuss shortly. So, let us start. So, let, let us go through all the topics that we have covered from the first lecture. As you know, we have covered more than 40 lectures. Uh, at the beginning, we had uh, a course on a uh, lecture on embedded system characteristics. We followed it up with a project demonstration. Then we saw how the uh, embedded computer could be implemented, many ways of implementing the embedded computers namely uh, using a uh, microprocessor or a application specific uh, controller and a single purpose computer. Then we uh, saw how the microcontroller which is a very uh, common and uh, useful application specific device could be used for embedded uh, system applications. Uh, we also saw, saw how we could implement uh, embedded computer, embedded system using a single purpose computer here. Then we looked at the salient features since our target was to use microcontrollers for implementing embedded systems, we con started concentrating on various issues of microcontrollers. We looked at the various uh, uh, salient features of modern microcontrollers. This was like a uh, collection of all the good features of contemporary microcontrollers, some or more may be available in the microcontroller that you may have chosen. Then how do you choose the right controller for your application and we looked at not only the technical aspects, but also other aspects which would impact the time to market and the economics of your project. After we did that, we looked at the ecosystem elements of a microcontroller. A microcontroller requires four essential elements for survival, for thriving in an embedded system application and they are power supply, reset, clock and the ability to download program from your development uh, host into the memory of the microcontroller. So, we looked at all those issues. Once we uh, got done with this, then we said all right, let us now try to visualize an embedded system using a six box model. In these six boxes, we looked at the input boxes which has sensors and uh, human input devices, the controller uh, box, then the output box with which the controller can interact with the outside world by controlling output devices such as motors and relays and LEDs and LCDs and so on. Then we looked at uh, uh, host and storage, what is meant by that uh, for storing a uh, lot of data that you, your application may uh, be generating. Then we looked at a box which allows you to, which allows the embedded system to communicate with the outside world. And last but not the least, we looked at the power supply block. Now, after having uh, seen all these blocks, we uh, also had some idea about what is this idea of electronic glue, the uh, electronic circuits which binds all these individual six boxes. We looked at uh, those aspects briefly. Then we had a dedicated session on the design of a power supply. The design of a power supply is very important. It is in my opinion a very neglected topic and I strongly recommend to you to focus more on design, understanding the design of power supplies. It will be a good skill to have. Once we were done with this, we started looking at the architecture of MSP 430. We looked at the CPU, the register uh, arrangement, the memory arrangement the flash and so on and so forth. After that, we had a session on how to install the code composer studio and the git software which allows you to maintain a repository of all the versions of programs that you would uh, end up writing for a given application, for a given project and so having such a mechanism is very useful. After that, we had a session on embedded C programming where we went through uh, uh, specifics of uh, pro C programming language in the context of embedded applications. Once we were done with that, we started looking at the input output features of MSP 430 microcontroller and we covered the digital input and output devices. We did some experiments uh, to connect outside LEDs and switches and uh, control those LEDs and switches. Then we looked at the 
specific aspects of the uh, microcontroller ecosystem in the context of MSP430, namely the clocking mechanisms, what all options of clocks you have on MSP430 and to recap here, MSP430 has a very rich mechanism, very rich source of clock sources which could be manipulated and navigated to various uh, CPU and other subsystem uh, blocks inside the MSP430 microcontroller. Uh, there is the low frequency crystal oscillator, there is a very low frequency oscillator uh, which is RC uh, based within the chip and then there is the DCO. And the three signals clock signals are namely A clock, the SM clock and the M clock. Then we looked at how many ways can we reset MSP430 microcontroller and the various low power modes that are available, how you can enter those modes to conserve power and once having entered, how do you exit those modes so that you could resume the normal operation. When we were looking at the clock, we also saw how the clock frequency could be dynamically changed and this would allow an embedded application to conserve power in case you do not want to operate at a very high frequency because the uh, current requirement at the time does not need you to, you can uh, reduce the clock frequency so as to conserve power. Then we started looking at some theoretical aspects as to how to drive output devices in the form of LEDs and relays and motors and uh, how to design the electronic circuit, namely these are the aspects of electronic glue, how to design the drivers for, for such devices. We also looked at various ways of reading inputs such as uh, a keypad or uh, things like that switches. Then we saw specifically how do we uh, send information out from the microcontroller for human interaction uh, namely through the 7 segment displays and an LCD display. And let me uh, mention here that although we used a character LCD, what is called as character LCD. Uh, you can also try to experiment with graphics LCDs, there are many many graphics LCDs available. In fact, the graphics LCDs have the advantage that they conserve, they consume much less power than the character LCD that the 16 cross 2 or 16 cross 4 character LCDs that are available in the market. These graphics LCDs also operate at 3.3 volts, so that is a very natural uh, you know amalgamation or marriage. Uh, between the MSP430 ecosystem and the LCD because you do not need to worry about ha having to uh, you know get additional power supply and that is a very important uh, could be an important consideration. Then we looked at the a very important aspect of uh, embedded systems and microcontrollers that is the interrupts. We had several examples how these interrupts could be uh, utilized so as to uh, perform the required task in a equitable fashion. When there are multiple things to be done, you cannot uh, round robin and you cannot do polling and uh, uh, implement everything that you want. And so, one of the methods of overcoming that obstacle is to uh, use interrupts. Then we looked at uh, another important feature of a microcontroller and embedded system um, which is the mechanism to count time and count events. And for that we looked at the MSP430 ti timer in the compare and capture mode. Also how we could use the timer for PWM pulse width modulation, although we also looked at a mechanism to generate pulse width modulation signal using a software uh, code only without the uh, requirement, without the uh, uh, implication or without the intervention of a timer. Uh, then we looked at MSP430 ADC, how we could use the ADC for so many applications, not only reading external analog sensors, but also using it as a seed to feed into our uh, LFSR based random number generators. We looked at various ADC interfacing issues, how to connect them to sensors. We looked at how to generate random numbers and then how do we control convert analog voltages from the microcontroller, although one of the methods is using PWM, but we looked at how additional uh, mechanisms such as R to R ladder networks could be used for generating analog voltages. Then we looked, we had a uh, lecture on MSP430 serial communication, we looked at UART in great detail, we also brief, uh, briefly covered I square C and SPI. And then once we had done this, this basically covered a uh, lot of uh, physical issues uh, of the uh, modules that are available, the functional blocks that are available inside a microcontroller. Now was the time of uh, improve our C programming skills and we looked at, uh, we looked at a mechanism to 
uh, interface a uh, four digit seven segment display in a multiplexed fashion how that would uh, improve uh, the performance of that display would be improved if you went from a uh, sequential uh, uh, mechanism to refresh the display to an interrupt based display. Uh, and then we had a lecture on how to plan for a project and here there was no specific uh, in, uh, you know dimension that uh, the project has to be necessarily uh, microcontroller based. It was a general uh, discussion that you start with a visualization and then uh, uh, start with the objectives then you have a visualization and then you plan for the electronic parts and then the enclosures and how the wiring and uh, have to has to be in place and documentation. This was very general topic, it uh, could be a non microcontroller uh, based project also. And then we looked at uh, various uh, methods of prototyping circuits, this would be very useful uh, if you are going to uh, you know play with microcontrollers or any other circuit uh, in future. And now once we have covered all these topics, now is a time to sort of pull build all of them bring all of them together in one last uh, you know like they say the uh, topping on the cake to integrate all these issues and illustrate it with a sample project based on MSP 430 that has been specifically implemented for this course. Uh, in the beginning I showed you so many projects that has been that have been implemented in my lab, but this specific project that is here with me right uh, next to me was uh, implemented during the uh, course of the recording of these videos by one of my students. And I am going to go through the entire process from visualization to uh, from the objectives to visualization and how it was implemented in this lecture. Alright, so uh, instead of saying we want to implement a project and that project could be any project, we are saying we want to implement a MSP 430 based project. This course has been about implementing an embedded system specifically using microcontrollers and even more specifically using the MSP 430 microcontroller. So, it makes a lot of sense to actually illustrate how you can plan uh, uh, test and implement a MSP 430 microcontroller project. And so, this uh, rest of this lecture is about that. So, as, a, as we discussed earlier in any uh, in any such activity you must start with an objective what do you want to implement unless you know specifically what do you want to implement what can how can you plan for it and so objective setting down the objective in black and white is very important just discussing that you want to do this uh, is not good enough because when you actually come to implementing it uh, you may forget what you actually wanted to implement or new ideas may creep in and that would make the implementation near impossible and so not only thinking about the objective but also to put it in black and white on a piece of paper is very important. Once you have done that then you start visualizing that uh, alright I want to implement this what would it look like or what would I want it to look like that is very important. Then you start planning based on that visualization and obviously instead of implementing the project uh, from scratch you would like to test some parts of it. So, that you can uh, ascertain the uh, author, uh, the uh, feasibility of your project because if at this point of time you find that some of the aspects that you visualized about or you put in the, in the objectives if they are uh, they are, you are not able to achieve then there is no point in proceeding with the project then you better resolve that issue. So, testing if you have access to certain modules or you can test it in some way some aspects of uh, your implementation it is a good idea. Once you are once you have done that testing which will give you a good confidence that till now the progress that you have made will lead to success then you can start uh, planning on creating the schematic from the schematic to create a uh, printed circuit board layout. If, if you have the necessary uh, you know uh, ecosystem support to actually fabricate it and in this case we have actually done that. Then you start prototyping meaning you put, put all the components together circuit fabrication and then you start implementing it maybe download the code and test parts of it and then eventually once everything is done you document it. So, I am going to show you that. So, what happened was uh, uh, a couple of years ago I was uh, coming to my institute and I saw a roadside uh, vendor selling these very nice uh, uh, glass uh, fish, uh, fish tanks fish bowls and uh, I was intrigued they looked very interesting although uh, the reason why they looked interesting is because 
he put colored water in some of these bowls. Anyway, I liked them uh, enough to take a picture and uh, so I wanted to see could I use this fish bowl to implement some project. I like to implement, uh, uh, use electronics to create artistic projects and so uh, this sort of caught my imagination. And so I said okay, okay, maybe I would put a circuit inside the fish bowl and see if I can power that circuit in some way which does not require me to drill hole into a glass bowl of course which is very difficult. But then how do I provide power to the circuit inside the glass bowl? One solution could be that I put a battery. But the moment I put a battery the problem is that once the battery is discharged I have to replace it. If it is a chargeable battery then again I have to take it out and uh, charge it. But that is when an idea came to my mind especially because in these uh, in this age we are talking about mobile phones which have a uh, wireless uh, charging mechanism that you get a certain mobile phones with a, a charging mat and you simply put your mobile phone on that mat and it gets charged. So I thought why not use such a mechanism into our system. So this was the, so once I started thinking about it I created a sketch which helped me visualize this project and if you see this sketch here and you see the implementation uh, I hope you agree that this is more or less a 100 percent uh, uh, reproduction of the uh, visualization. The actual implementation is almost 100 uh, percent uh, same as visualized. So, what do we have here that we have few candles inside and we have these uh, string of LEDs and the reason why I thought of these string of LEDs was also because uh, you may have seen uh, uh, in, the, in these uh, last couple of years. Uh, on traffic junctions these uh, kids sell balloons which have uh, beautiful uh, you know LED strings uh, strung on those balloons. And in fact I had bought some of them and I found that these uh, the LED string was uh, uh, unique. It was unlike I had other LED strings that I had seen and in fact we uh, the, the LED string that is in used here is exactly from that source. Uh, it is actually two very thin wires and uh, the LED is uh, uh, contained in some glue uh, and these two wires are actually turning those LEDs on and off. And of course, these are not addressable LEDs meaning I cannot individually turn each LED on or off or I cannot control it individually. I can control all of them together. And so, if I apply a voltage to the two wires the LEDs will glow, I can apply less and more voltage and then it will its intensity will change. So, that is how uh, these uh, LED balloons that uh, I saw uh, last year and the year before last. So, I thought I should integrate that in the uh, in this project. So, this was the visualization and then we started uh, with the implementation. So, the first part was since we, uh, so the objective is now to create a wirelessly powered art installation. This could very well I could put it in my uh, office here or I could take it home and uh, set it out in my drawing room and it would be a great uh, piece of art uh, uh, sort of a conversation starter if guests come uh, come home and so on and so forth. So, uh, question is there are two important parts in this one is how do I supply power to this uh, microcontroller circuit and then the microcontroller circuit itself what all do I want to do it. As you see uh, in this uh, visualization there are four uh, candles uh, looking uh, candle like structures they are not candles of course, they are implemented out of LEDs, but they must behave like candles. So, they need to flicker. So, the part was uh, that part was about this microcontroller circuit. So, the first aspect was spent on the first activity was spent on getting the wireless power supply working. And for that what we did was uh, we uh, read through the available literature and then it turns out that the mechanism of uh, wireless power transfer is the transmission of energy without wires as is very obvious from the from the uh, the term. Uh, and what it involves is uh, that you apply a time varying electromagnetic field uh, and launch it in some way uh, over space and then on the other side uh, you must have some mechanism to receive this power to extract this from the uh, space. Uh, it turns out that uh, wireless power, power transfers are largely of two categories one is called near field non radiative and the second is far field. In the near field non radiative method again there are two sub methods one is uh, one uses magnetic field and uh, uses inductive coupling using coils and the second one is uses electric fields and uses capacitive coupling 
and for capacity coupling it uses plates electrodes. Uh, the second method is uh, far field the uh, technique here uses microwave uh, radiation and in fact people have done projects that normal uh, uh, you know transmissions of telephone towers you could actually receive energy from these if you uh, put a create a receiving antenna in fact that method is called rectant meaning a receiving rectifying antenna uh, please search for this term and you would get to know what i mean here so that method is a far field using a radiative method the more common ones are near field which means you put the transmitter of the uh, power and the receiver close to each other and uh, sure enough you can actually create such a uh, mechanism very very easily in fact we have these in our lab for demonstration for school kids and it requires just a handful of components if you see this is nothing but a couple of uh, you know um, a feet or so of wire of a certain gauge we in this case we use uh, 28 uh, swg to create uh, 10 turns 10 turns of uh, coil we a simple lab uh, NPN transistor like 2N2222 and a 1 kilo ohm resistor here in series at the base and you can use a simple 1.5 volt uh, uh, you know uh, alkaline battery to power this and on the other side you just double the number of uh, turns from 10 you make a single coil of 20 turns and you put a, a resistor if you want or if you uh, like you do not need to put a resistor either. And when you bring this second coil which is powering the LED close to the, uh, the first coil here you would, uh, you would find that the uh, because of inductive coupling you are basically uh, able to turn the white LED on. Here is a simple implementation that we have in the lab this is, this is the uh, transmitter as you see this is the uh, NPN transistor this is the coil in two parts. This, that is the center tab which uh, connects to the VCC. This you can apply here a 1.5 volt cell here like this here. Once you do that then this fellow this coil will start radiating and if you uh, put this second coil now this has double the number of turns or rather the sum total of these terms. Uh, some total of these turns are also here and I just put two LEDs back to back and if you put one this coil on top of the, uh, the transmitting coil you will see that these LEDs light up and so this is basically wireless power transfer. The only issue is the amount of power being transmitted from here to here is very very small it hardly uh, it just turns these LEDs on quite brightly though uh, but not enough to power several LEDs and a microcontroller circuit too. And so the way to go about it was to scale the uh, power being handled at the transmitter. And one way to scale that was to increase the voltage. But when you increase the voltage it turns out that this transistor should be capable of handling that large power dissipation. And uh, if you experiment with such a small transistor you will find that soon enough uh, as you start increasing the voltage the transistor will simply not be able to handle the increased power dissipation and it will simply burn off. And so we replace this transistor with a more powerful transistor and the more powerful transistor in our case what we did was we used a uh, TIP3055 this is a very hefty power transistor which has a VCE max of I think about 60 volts but that is not as much important as that the IC the collector current maximum that you can have on this is 15 amperes and that is the important uh, 15 amperes. So, that is the important part the part uh, necessary for our requirement and so this uh, transistor was chosen at the uh, as we start increasing the supply voltage the transistor becomes extremely hot and the, the only way to handle that is to attach it to a heat sink. A heat sink does nothing but increases the power dissipation capability of the transistor. It increases the metal surface through which the uh, transistor can dissipate that heat. And so we did that and we uh, did some testing and we found that if we applied 6 volt at the primary that means 6 volt in the, the uh, energy uh, the, uh, the transmitter part 
on the secondary side you could easily get 4.5 volts and you could uh, get up to 100 milliamperes of current. Of course, at that time the uh, source was consuming much more, it was consuming about one and a half, uh, two amperes of current. So, the efficiency of this system is extremely poor and that is not normally the case because uh, the your uh, wireless uh, phone chargers and increasingly uh, you know um, vehicles are being charged using this method. It does use near field non radiative technique, but there is a uh, further specialization in that it uses uh, uh, resonance. So, it uses a resonant circuit where the efficiency is very high and so, uh, but of course, the complexity of such a circuit increases. We have chosen to keep it simple because the idea was to illustrate this process from visualization to implementation and therefore, we have kept a uh, non resonant uh, mechanism which of course, consumes uh, waste more power, but it serves our purpose. Now, now once we have uh, once we were able we are confident about the power supply part, uh, the second part was to concentrate on the microcontroller circuit and for doing that instead of creating a custom circuit our lunch box comes into uh, picture and we use that to connect several LEDs on the pins and wrote program to with a linear feedback shift register to generate random numbers and for making one candle, one uh, candle we use two LEDs. So, it could be something like this, one LED here, one more LED and then a limiting resistor, this is your VCC and this goes to two pins of the microcontroller and they were controlled together with the uh, random bits being thrown at both these LEDs and so what you end up getting is a flickering effect and once we tested that we were confident that we would be able to uh, control these uh, candles and then since the, uh, the LED string we wanted to uh, blink the LEDs on that string we wanted to increase and decrease the intensity. So, we connected it to an appropriate pin of the microcontroller which had a PWM output. So, that we could uh, you know ramp up the LED intensity make it uh, go down and so on and so forth. So, uh, this was tested using the lunch box and once that was there then we started uh, creating the schematic and from the schematic the board layout and so let me show you the schematic. So, this is the uh, schematic diagram for this MSP430 based wireless uh, uh, power transfer project. Let us go through all the uh, parts of this uh, schematic. This is the power supply part. Uh, so, uh, on this on these two terminals uh, you would be able to connect a coil like this here and then this would uh, generate AC, it would receive the uh, voltage in AC form and so you are going to have rectifiers. This is the bridge rectifier. These uh, you see if you notice these are not normal uh, rectifier diodes, they are short key diodes and the reason why short key diodes were used is that the short key diode voltage drop is much less than the drop that you would get with a silicon diode. And because we want to extract as much power from the system as possible, we did not want to waste the voltage over a silicon diode. So, short key diodes were used and then it was uh, filtered out using this uh, uh, 4700. Uh, um, Forty seven hundred uh, micro uh, microfarad uh, capacitor, as you see here. So this was the uh, uh, part of the power supply. Now this would this, as I mentioned in our test, this would provide us about four point five volts. Now of course, MSP four thirty. Uh, now when you start uh, designing the system, you would uh, put the requirements for the microcontroller. And as I mentioned, you have to look at four aspects. How do I provide the power supply for the microcontroller? Uh, when you decide that you are going to implement it with MSP430, you have to worry about providing about 3.3 volts. You can go maximum up to 3.6 volts, you can look up the data sheet, it can go down to uh, 1.8 volts, but of course, at 1.8 volts the LEDs would not light up all the LEDs, all the colored LEDs and so you have to up, if we choose the supply voltage to be 3.3 volts, you have to worry about getting 3.3 volts from this 4.5 volt raw voltage. So, we will come to that briefly. Then once we have the uh, uh, power supply available, every project must indicate that the circuit is working, the system is working and though, so we have, to, we have provided a power on LED. Please remember that whenever you make any project, uh, provide for a power on LED, otherwise 
if the system is not working, you would wonder why is it not working. It could be that the power supply itself is not available or if the power supply is available, then you know the power supply is not an issue, you should look at other aspects. So, providing a power on LED is very important, that is what this second uh, box does for you. Now, as I mentioned, we wanted 3.3 volts, our source was 4.5 volts, so we could use a regulator and again we have uh, seen various regulator options. We could use a switching regulator, but again the there is no need because we are getting 4.5 volt draw voltage and we could choose a LDO low dropout voltage regulator. And so, we use this 3 point LP2950 with 3.3 volt output. Uh, it works very well with the differential voltage here in this case uh, for up to 1.2 volts, it, this regulator works very well. And so, this was chosen to uh, power the MSP430. The expected current for the MSP430 itself, if you are going to use the internal DCO clock, the, re, the default clock of 1.1 megahertz, you know that the current is of the less than a milliampere. And so, uh, this, this regulator is uh, quite happy to provide that current. And all uh, circuits require uh, decoupling capacitors and usually we should do 10 microfarad electrolytic and 0.1 ma microfarad ceramic and connect it to the output of the supply voltage near to the nearer the pins of the microcontroller. So, this was the bypass capacitors. Here is the MSP430 circuit here as you see. Uh, this pin is the reset since we uh, are not uh, doing anything, we are not resetting it manually, we have pulled it up uh, with this resistor. So, that the only way to reset this system is to turn the power off and turn it on again. And then all the rest of the pins here is the supply voltage connected here, here is the ground and these are all. So, this, these two, these two, these two and these two, they are dri driving two LEDs in the uh, output low mode, meaning when these outputs are low, the LEDs will be on. Okay. And then this P 2.1 was chosen to drive the string, because on P 2.1 you can have a PWM output. And rest of the pins since they were not being used, they have been left unconnected. Let us uh, go here. Now, I have 4.5 volts available, I am going to use uh, white LEDs. In fact, I would choose what is called as a warm white shade because warm white would uh, mimic a candle much better than uh, you know cool white would do. So, warm white, but a warm white LED requires more than 3.5 volts for operation. My supply voltage of the MSP430 power supply is only 3.3. So, instead of uh, directly driving what we chose to do was as follows. We took the uh, MSP output here and we could have a low side driver as we have already uh, you know understand that term and then we could have a LED like this. So, this is the raw voltage raw VCC of 4.5 volts and this is the 3.3 volts MSP430 power supply and if you wanted to drive the LEDs with 4.5 volts, uh, the only way to do that would be to isolate the supply voltage using this NPN transistor as a switch that is a low side switch. And so, in, we would need 8 of these switches, 8 of these transistors. Instead of using individual 8 transistor, what we uh, chose to do was use this uh, uh, NPN driver called ULN2803. It has 8 NPN type of low side drivers. Uh, and then, so this was connected to the output, these inputs of the driver were connected to the uh, MSP430 pins and these outputs were connected to LEDs. These are the current limiting resistors. Now, we are left with only the, uh, the mechanism to drive the uh, string of LEDs and for that we took another transistor and connected the string here. So, this is the uh, raw supply VCC here is raw supply voltage and the string was connected between this point and this point like this and a connector has been provided so that you can remove it if you like. And then these are the four connectors for four candles, each of them would have two LEDs like this and this and this is the supply voltage. So, as, as I discussed it will be in the uh, low side switch mode that is the anode will be connected to uh, VCC and the cathodes will be connected uh, will be controlled by the microcontroller pins. So, this uh, completes the schematic of the uh, project. Here is the board layout. This was implemented uh, like a, on a single sided PCB. Uh, the blue wires indicate tracks and the red wires indicate jumpers. 
because the uh, signals have to cross. So you bring them up on jumper wires and then put them, bring them back in. So as you see, it only uses about one, two, three, four, five, six jumpers. And now cutting a circular PCB is a challenge. Although in my lab, I do have a CNC machine and I can cut a PCB in any shape. I wanted it to be cut in a way that anybody with basic access to basic tools could do it. So we decided not to, although the, uh, you see a circle here, uh, we didn't implement a circle. What we did was we cut a square which could uh, uh, inscribe this uh, circle and then we cut out these parts of the square here. So ended up making an octagon. So let us see how this, this was implemented. So the PCB was cut as you see there is a circle uh, you know marking inside but it was actually cut like a square and then the corners were cut off using a hacksaw. So all this whole this whole stuff was done using a normal hacksaw and uh, the we have already seen the PCB fabrication method all that was done the uh, layout was stuck here and then uh, the board was put in ferrochloride the raw uh, PCB board was put in ferrochloride etched and then once that etching was complete the uh, ink from the laser printer was removed using this uh, scrubber and then um, it was uh, drilled and sprayed with that acrylic spray and then we started soldering. Here is the coil at the bottom and on the top you would see here is the this is the top side as you see e, the top side has been printed with the what, what is called as the identification layer. So this PCB actually went through two processes of uh, you know transferring the layout. The bottom layer was the tracks and the top layer was the, uh, the, the identification layer so that we know where each of these components are going to be put and this can be easily done. Uh, and then once uh, all the things were soldered, drilled and all, all these components were soldered and these uh, plastic things are nothing but thick straws and they were glued uh, on the base with hot glue and inside you see these two white LEDs. And in this, uh, the current implementation, I have covered these, these uh, LEDs with the hot glue so that it can diffuse that light even better. And as you see, this is the uh, string of LEDs, you see, this is the string of LEDs and this bubble that you see here, little drop here, droplet, that contains a LED of various colors. So this was all soldered together and then the power supply part, uh, so a wooden base was taken at the center of it, a hole was drilled uh, large enough for this uh, coil, the transmitting coil to be installed. And then on the bottom side, this is the hefty transistor that I mentioned. And this is the heat sink, this is the heat sink and the transistor was mounted. Uh, you may see some white uh, paste kind of thing that is not paste that is what is called as heat sink compound. It uh, uh, removes any air gaps between the metal surface of the transistor and the heat sink and provides better conductivity for the heat. This is we, this was done on a general purpose PCB and because when we put it uh, other way around, it, this would uh, not allow the base to be horizontal. So four mounting screws were installed on the uh, wooden base and this is the close up of the, uh, the transistor. Anyway, this is the final implementation as you see here, uh, the fish bowl containing the, uh, the, the art installation and at the bottom, this is the power supply part. And I have this whole thing here, but let us go through the code first and then I will demonstrate this project to you. The code is very simple. You have the LED strip on P2.1, this is our uh, PWM output. Then there are some uh, constants defined for increasing and decreasing the brightness and for blinking LEDs. This is the register setting for timer 1. Uh, the timer 1 has been programmed for um, the PWM output here. Then uh, these are variables declared here, these are all declared as uh, volatile because some interrupt is happening. This is the uh, whenever the timer interrupt happens it goes into it and uh, in this uh, at some point it will blink the LED and at some point after some time it will uh, you know do PWM on, the, on those LEDs. So this is that timer uh, uh, code which controls that uh, string of LEDs. And this is the simple main code where we have defined the P1 uh, port 1 as all outputs. This is the seed for LFSR, a 32-bit LFSR was uh, chosen 
and this is the seed for that uh, LFSR. Although it means that every time you turn the system off and on, it will always start with the same pattern. And one way to overcome that would be, as we have discussed, we could use uh, ADC, a spare ADC channel uh, without connecting it to any source. Just read it and you will get a random number and use that to feed into the linear feedback shift register for subsequent random numbers. And then we stop the watchdog timer here. Uh, we call the function to uh, you know program the timer one and then we uh, set the uh, bits in the SR register to enable the interrupts. And then enter a infinite loop where we are simply outputting the LFSR bits on all the 8 pins of port 1 that is what we are doing with some delay. This delay was experimentally uh, ascertained for this value so that it gives you flickering effect. If it is too slow you will not see, if it is too fast again you will not see. So, this was uh, you know inferred experimentally and once this code is uh, compiled now the problem is how do you uh, put the microcontroller till now we have been uh, downloading our code into the lunch box. So, that is the uh, second last aspect that I want to discuss. Uh, you can do your experiments on lunch box. And there are similar uh, evaluation kits available such as uh, Texas Instruments very own TI's uh, what is called as MSP 430 launch pad. This is a very very worthy uh, uh, evaluation kit. It allows you to uh, you know debug the code also and it has a mechanism that the pins which are used for programming the target microcontroller there are jumpers you could remove those jumpers and connect it to your target board. But for this present case what we uh, decided to do was we tested everything on the lunch box programmed the IC uh, uh, in the lunch box and then simply took it out and inserted it into the PCB of the system here. And of course, you may need to do some iterations if it does not work the way you want it to work, you can always uh, put it back reprogramming and put it in. Of course, there are some dangers that the pins of the microcontroller will get bent and so on and so forth, but for a simple project uh, that should not be a worry. So, uh, but when you are developing your own projects, you have to be aware of the need for an appropriate programmer so that you can download the code from the desktop into the uh, memory of the microcontroller and in this present case we use the MSP430 lunchbox. Uh, I hope that you would continue using the lunchbox. You can get more MSP430 microcontrollers from the open market or you could even send request mails to, uh, to TI. They are happy to offer uh, free uh, ICs provided you make that request from your official student email address. Uh, you could uh, request them and then you could use those ICs uh, in your projects. And if these ICs are MSP430G2553, you could continue to use the existing lunch box that you have. So, this is, uh, this is all for this project. I hope uh, we were able to illustrate how all the skills that we have acquired over the course of this uh, lectures, series of lectures that all of these could be integrated at the end to implement a MSP430 based project. Uh, let me show how it works. So, as you see this is blinking here, I can uh, you know remove it and it stops working by because there is no source of power. Let me also take it out of the uh, fishbowl to show you the uh, circuit here. Now, I could put it back uh, on top of it and you know it starts working again. Why? Because here is the, uh, the receiving coil and in this there is the uh, transmitting coil. I put it on top of it, it starts working and I can remove it, put it back into my uh, fish bowl and then transfer it over here and you see it starts working again. So, this is how it works. I hope uh, you enjoyed this course. I hope uh, it enthused you to fall in love with electronics in general and uh, microcontroller circuits in particular. I hope that you will continue to build more and more projects. Uh, not only in your student life, but uh, when you enter the professional life and I would uh, be very happy to hear from you should you want to share your success stories with me. Thank you very much. See you soon.